Okay, um, well, good afternoon um, from the UK um, to everyone who's joining us this lovely sunny day, which seems to be sunny everywhere. Um, welcome to um, our th third webinar in our series of six on the theme um, of reducing plagiarism through assessment design. Um, our speaker this week is Dr. Mike Reddy, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about Mike in a second. As you can see, Mike on the chat window there. Hi, Mike. Um, firstly, I'd just like to find out where people are joining us from today. Um, so I'm just going to move a little poll onto your screen, just so we get an idea. Um, where people are. So if you could vote on the on the poll there and just tell us where you are today, um, so we know so. What kind of representation. Be, there's going to be lots of polls today. Mike has got lots of interaction for you. Okay, so. Um, Quite a lot of people from Europe. Excuse me while I'm looking to the side of the screen. Um, a few people joining us from the States. Good morning um, to you there. Um, Africa, Australia, Asia, um, Central and South America. So um, good representation. Oh, yeah, back there. Okay, so um, it's good to have so many people joining us today. I'm just going to quickly close. That down. Okay, so um, before we get started, I'll just introduce myself. Um, my name is Jill Rell. Um, I work. I'm an academic advisor working for Turnitin um, and PlagiarismAdvice.org. Um, and my my role has been to facilitate these sessions. Um, the sessions are led by members of our academic network. Um, Mike is a member of our academic network and um, other colleagues who have um, various responsibilities for addressing plagiarism around the world or who are enthusiasts in various different um, areas, um, we've invited to come along and tell us about um, what they're doing. Is everyone able to hear me pro properly there? Mike says I'm breaking up a little bit. Um, you okay there, Mike? Yeah. Okay, so the format of today's session, um, I'll just continue, um, is that Mike will um, talk um, a little bit around this issue um, of it reducing plagiarism through assessment de design and give us some interesting points um, from his own experience. Um, this, the, 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 the webinar is actually based on um, a tip sheet um, which we produced, which I'm putting up on the screen now, um, and which you can... Um, get from our website, the URL is on the top of the slide there, um, and we can also send this to you after the session. Um, and really, um, this is the series of, of, of webinars are based around a series of six tip sheets, various issues for addressing plagiarism and promoting academic integrity. And obviously, this is the session which will look at um, how we can reduce plagiarism through the way in which we design our assessments. So um, Mike will take questions um, midway through um, through the session. Um, if you'd like to put any questions or comments on the chat window, um, we'll collate those and put those to Mike um, in a few minutes. Um, and I think we'll probably get started. Just to really introduce Mike more fully, um, like our previous two um, presenters, um, I'm not sure Mike, how Mike would feel about this, but Mike is a bit of a veteran in the um, plagiarism area. He's been working in this area for over 10 years, and he was actually part of the JISC um, steering committee in 2000, um, which augmented the, the plagiarism advisory service in the UK in particular. Um, he's been a very influential figure in the UK in offering strategic direction and much valued support, certainly to myself and to colleagues and working in this area via the plagiarism advisory service. Um, that was the forerunner of plagiarismadvice.org. Um, he's still a key member of the Plagiarism Advice Ad Advisory Board, and he's usually a lively, co lively contributor to the International Plagiarism Conference, which takes place every two years. He's also um, quite um, a widely um, published um, um, 
commentator on plagiarism on various different media. Um, he's been involved in t TV and radio representations on plagiarism. He's offered his expert guidance in various cases on plagiarism um, and has been has actually offered insights into cases in Romania um, quite recently. Um, after plagiarism, um, gaming is his second love. Um, he's the program, program leader for games and future technology at the University of South Wales. Um, although he admits to um, being more interested in playing games rather than writing and reviewing on the academic side. Um, his love of gaming has led him to develop various different and novel forms of assessment for his students, which he'll be sharing with us during the session. Um, and he was the subject of a, um, an article in a publication in the, in the UK back in 2006 because he um, created outrage by, say, by saying that he allowed his class to set their own exams. Um, with the quote that um, a lecturer lets candidates write questions to engender, engender trust. Um, so hopefully he'll tell us a little bit more about that um, during the course of the session. Um, one other point which I picked up about Mike. Oh, yeah, I promise I won't speak backwards today. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, I can get my slides up now and that you can all hear me. And I'll try, if I can, to, uh, to type uh, summaries of what I'm saying so that uh, you, uh, um, you are able to follow me if the audio is not very good. Um, uh, and uh, apologies to all my colleagues because this is an open plan office and they will have to hear me talking at you, uh, unfortunately, for a little while. Okay, right. Um, so the big thing here is to be creative. Okay, so we're going to try and come up with ideas to be creative. And uh, this is a picture of my daughter. So you can see uh, so, um, the idea of, uh, of uh, my daughter before and after having an injection of creativity. So, uh, and then we're going to go from there. The idea here being that we can uh, use our knowledge to ex explore and escape from our traditional ways of doing things. Okay, so um, as, I, as I've already mentioned, uh, I'm going to... Um, Jill's already mentioned, I'm going to be using the, uh, the wonderful PDF um, that she showed earlier as the basis for my talk. I'm going to extend and elaborate on each of the sections of that wonderful one-page summary PDF. Um, and someone's saying they can't hear, so I'm going to try and do, uh, do a summary. So I will base my talk on the uh, tip sheet. Okay, um, so the first thing is, um, the first bit of advice is the idea of updating assignments. So um, the question is, update what? Um, we don't always have a clear idea about what an assessment or what an assignment is. So the idea here that we're trying to reduce assign, reduce plagiarism uh, is the aim. Um, but um, the, uh, what we have to do is try and think about how we can do that. So uh, here's an obvious example um, uh, where we are technically solving a problem, but uh, are we doing it in a good way? So um, first off, let's say you know, ask what is an assignment. Well, um, to me, it's a bit it's a it's a, a bit of a mystery. Um, I, I, you as qualified as I am to say what an assignment is, but the idea being 
here that we're trying to measure um, the, the quality or the performance or the ability of a student. So. Are, and are they fair? Uh, now, I've um, I've tried a number of different approaches. The um, the one which Jill mentioned earlier is the uh, self-set examination, which caused a bit of a furore, and was uh, I was accused of single-handedly uh, uh, causing the downfall of higher education because I let students set their own exam, and how dreadful that is. Um, and that wasn't the best uh, the best example, but uh, it certainly didn't put me off, and that's the important thing. Um, so uh, the, um, the other thing we can look at is the idea of um, peer uh, negotiated assignments and so it's by participatory design. Um, and I think we have a, 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 a poll that I wouldn't mind you trying to put up, please, Christine. With a bit of luck, it's trying new things. So I just wanted to get an idea from people what things they tried. Um, and I've kind of, well, obviously attempted to try and do all of these things. So we'll see what, um, see how we're doing. So we've got a few people who are saying that they've tried open book or self-set exams. That's good. Um, and a few doing oratory or preparatory work for vivas. So where the assignment is actually just the notes for a performance or for an oral examination. Most people have tried that, but there's a few things that people haven't tried. So uh, wacky and way out media. So um, an example of that would be um, uh, is uh, setting them a, a uh, an SMS or um, text message let's say so um, okay um, and peer negotiated assignments someone's asked um, the idea here being that um, what you um, what you're going to assess and how you're going to assess it is something that you you discuss with the students concerned so um, you can say for example say we're going to do a group work here do you want the group presentation included in the actual formal summative assessment, or do you want it to be formative? Ah, and someone's saying, what is an allowed to fail assignment? Okay, I'm hoping everyone can hear this. Um, an allowed to, allow to fail assignment is where there is, no, um, fen there, there is no finish post that they have to get across. They can actually fail to achieve something and still have gone through a good process of, of learning. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. How can you have student choice when you validate the document dictates marking right here in format of summative assessments? Um, that's a good question. And um, I think most assignments schedules that are set and written in stone for module descriptions uh, do allow for a certain degree of uh, variability and flexibility just because, for example, a module descript doesn't give the assignment. It says the type of assignment that's included. And I think in that respect, it's possible for us to have um, some, uh, some leeway and some discussion with the students. Obviously, that has to be guided by the lecturer because they need to be able to produce evidence that an external examiner would be happy with, uh, with validating. Uh, but I think that's the important thing. I think we're done with the... Uh, with the poll now. Thank you, Christine. Lovely. Okay, so um, already we've got some interesting questions and we can raise these later on uh, about my particular examples or how I interpret things. But I think it's important for us to, to proceed if that's possible. Okay. All right. So um, I think one of the big things is uh, what is assessment really rather than what's an assignment. And uh, I'm just going to quote Sinead O'Connor now, which is often people ask me to describe what kind of music I make. I say, if you could describe music, you wouldn't need music. And the idea here that assessment is actually an experience that you're going to go through, um, not just um, the creation of a deliverable. And um, one example I really recommend that you look at later is, is, is down there, 
is the uh, is the video uh, link that I've got, which is to a piece of rap rap poetry, and that's something where if you if you read the poem, it would have a completely different meaning to you experiencing it in this video uh, animated form. So the idea here being that assessment is actually a process that you go through rather than um, a uh, rather than something that, that defines a deliverable that has to be then delivered. Um, and I've got a question up here. How can you have student choice when your validated document dictates marking criteria? We'll, I think we'll come back to that with some examples in a minute. Okay, so um, the this, this second section here of the, uh, the tip sheet is the idea of using technology to engage students. And you can see here that uh, technology can be a bridge and um, but the issue is can it backfire and what technology do we use and I'm going to also briefly talk about what social media uh, what is social media and what we can how, how can we use it um, and in so Wendell says can we have a copy of the tip sheet yes you can I think it is available on the website so uh, but I've, I've reproduced um, in on every slide the um, the sec relevant sections and then I've further down or on top of to then add it to that. So the first thing is, what is technology? So um, here um, we have a lovely quote that I saw off uh, Twitter. There's a wonderful Ed Chat um, hashtag that regularly comes up with some interesting discussions on Twitter. And uh, this is one I'm going to read out. Imagine a school with kids who can read and write, but where there are many teachers who can't, and you have a metaphor for the information age that we live in. And I think I'm going to come back to that point a little bit later. Often, um, technology that we're, that our students are very familiar with, are willing to put a lot of time into learning, is something that for us older people, and I've got grey in my beard here, um, is a challenge, shall we say, and, and keeping on top of it all is difficult. Um, and obviously, you can get some strange things like, as I said, this is a this is a new television that I've just got, and there's a, a button on my remote control that has no function, and I'm not entirely sure why they've told me that, but never mind. Okay, um, but one of the big things here about technology is that it is actually ubiquitous, and um, we have to dive in to the new. Um, rather than clinging to the raft of the old. Um, and uh, I think it's important that we, uh, that we also assume that something just because it's novel isn't necessarily a very good thing. So although I completely agree with the, the tip sheet saying we should embrace technology, we have to be very careful. And here's some of the downsides of what that might be. And the first is the idea of social media. Um, and as you can see here, um, social media has some, some interesting uh, uh, kind of side effects in that they're a great place for us to actually do that communication. This is where our students are actually talking. But they also want to have independence and they want to have the idea of ownership. So uh, it's very important to realize that if we follow our students into social media like Facebook, Twitter, etc., um, they may not be particularly very keen on us following them. Uh, and similarly, when we set up a wonderful virtual learning environment, forums like Moodle or whatever, um, they, they may not be very keen to go there. I mean, an old friend of mine who's a gardener said, you, d you build a path in a garden where the grass gets worn out. And that's where you put the path. You wait and see where people walk, and then you uh, you put the path there. You don't build a path and then complain when they're not walking on the path. And that's the that, that is the problem with technology. Sometimes we can put a lot of effort into creating um, spaces and forums and communications, and then the students just don't go there. It's like a ghost town. But we also have to bear in mind that quality is an issue as well. So. Um, Twitter and this this wonderful quote that I saw here, which I think is just marvelous, um, and you know, just because we have new technology doesn't mean we have new and good material. It can be quite poor too. And just to uh, just to uh, remind ourselves that we're academics here, the first rule of the Soros Club is you don't need to talk about, mention of, speak of, discuss, chinwag, that or chat about the Soros Club. 
anyone doesn't get the reference, then please, the Fight Club is a wonderful film. Okay, but as I said before, um, Twitter and social media can be very distracting. And uh, the, the, the downside of us using technology and jumping into these, apart from offending the students because we've done that, is that we can get pulled into a whole maelstrom of material which is uh, uh, quite disturbing and quite, <laughs> quite distracting as well. But it is also very, very important um, to look at the, the, the quality of social media and actually realise that it is a tool because the main reason why it's a tool is because people are already there and they're voted with their feet. And if we can sensitively take part in that debate, then uh, I think it's important that we can, um, we can do that too. Okay, and again, I'm going to read this out. Simply put, we can't keep preparing students for a world that doesn't exist. We can't keep ignoring the formidable cognitive skills they're developing on their own. And above all, we must stop disparaging digital prowess just because some of us over 40 or happen to possess it, an institutional grudge match where the young cannot can sabotage an entire culture. And I think it's very important when we're, when we're looking at that quote that, um, that we realize that it, you know, the, one of the main reasons why we're having to look at um, redesigning assessment is because the knowledge economy that we grew up in, where it would take weeks for a paper to come through and into library loans, is gone. And we've got, um, we've got to make sure that our students are as aware that we are, that the quality of material um, and where it's come from, its provenance, is still very, very important. And that's one of the main reasons why academic skills are actually still topical and viable in today's internet society. And I think we've got another, um, another poll here about being technologically literate. If we can have that up, please, Christina. So, are you, do you consider yourself to be technologically literate? Okay. That's very good. Most people here are saying yes. I mean, you're involved in a webinar, so. Uh, some lovely chat going on here. I wish I could read it and present at the same time. I think we've got a pretty sub substantial yes, we're technologically literate. So, could we have the next uh, poll up, please? Have you delivered material? Thank you, Christina. Okay, so have you de delivered material via, and then a variety of different ways of doing it. So I'm going to say yes, and others. We'll see what other people say too. Okay, I'll be interested with the other that a lot of people are voting for now. But actually, it's interesting that quite a few of the social media sites are not being used very much. Facebook's quite high, which is good. I'd like to hear your experiences later. Um, yes, the slides will be available later. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Good, good. Okay. Right, so I think what we can do now is just before we talk about the process is um, to have any, uh, let's review some of the questions that people have come up with so far. Um, and I'm uh, happy to talk about the specifics about things I've tried as well. A little video. Hi, Mike. Hi, Hi, Jill. So we've got a few here um, from Sarah. How can you have right. student choice? Um, I, I've got here a few questions. Okay. Have you? Could, have you? How can you have student choice? I think we've covered that in a little bit. How do you encourage students to use Moodle that forums for assessment rather than using other systems, i.e., Facebook? Okay. Well, I think Linda asked that question. Um, I think that. We shouldn't. Um, the issue, as I said, about when where do you put a path in a garden? If they're using Facebook, it means that they're more in control than we are, and they've. I think they've probably decided for that very reason to use Facebook. So um, uh, I think that we shouldn't necessarily try and encourage them to use Moodle in preference to other systems. But I can see that the chaos of Using Facebook, especially when you're not a Facebook friend or you're not liked in that um, in that group, it can be quite difficult to find out that people have been discussing on Facebook, but at least they've been discussing it. And I've had that personally where students have said, well, we've all been discussing on Facebook this assignment, and we all think, and you're thinking, 
oh no, what have they been saying on Facebook? But at least, you know, at least they're able to have that discussion and it means that somewhere people are being exposed to that, to that conversation. Um, someone's also said, what, what, do it in 140 character ass assessment. Well, um, Voltaire once wrote, um, if I'd had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. And I think the idea here being that if you can try and reduce the size of an assignment, you aren't necessarily reducing the amount of time it takes to do the assignment. Because if, they, if you say you've got 500 words, then people are going to have to think very hard about what those 500 words are. And the distillation of that, the very, very logical extreme of that is the idea of 140 characters. What would you say in 140 characters? And people will think very, very hard about that 140 characters. And in the end, isn't that what we're trying to do is help them to, you know, encourage them to think. Um, someone else has said here, yeah, how do you rate the quality of answers on social media? Um, hmm. I think one of the big problems with the internet is, the, is that, you know, as Abraham Lincoln said, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. Um, and um, I think we have, to, we have to allow people to, uh, to be aware of the fact or learn that quality of information on the internet can be very partial. So that's one of the academic skills that is actually a really valuable thing the universities can pull out to people. And I think right now we'll go back to the slides if that's okay, and then we'll do some more questions in a minute. Okay. So um, the, one of the big things here I'm going to say is um, assessing the process. Um, and that obviously this is one of the pieces of advice I think is very, very important on, uh, on the tip sheet. Um, it's quite difficult to do that. And I will warn you now, the biggest problem with assessing the process and doing it properly is it's going to double, triple, or quadruple the amount of time it takes you to do assessment. And if you see that as a valuable part of the learning that you're being paid to help them do, then that's fine. But it will mean rescheduling and time management and changing the ethos for yourself. And also your managers need to support that process. And that's contact time. You know, when you're giving feedback like that, that's actually contact time should be considered part of the uh, educational process and part of your contact hours that you are you know legally obligated to provide but it's also important when you're assessing the process to be aware that the students may not be up front and able to to see initially why that will be a useful thing they will see a deadline and they'll start working maybe here and maybe they'll be starting working here but by the time they get to here, they're definitely having to start because they're seeing that deadline. So that big block of time that they've got where they could have get, got feedback from you and asked for your advice, they will have used up. So it is important that students are aware that their time management has to change if you're going to assess the process. Uh, and they can't just turn up on the last day and hand you a piece of, a piece of work. They should be there right from, the, right from the very beginning and working all the way through and discussing things through you. And that's actually in itself a very good way to reduce plagiarism because it's more personal and they've actually had contact with that. Okay, so the big thing as, as is, um, is presented in the slides down here is that the end result has to be actually the least valuable thing of all the things that are being taken part. Now I can solve a Rubik's Cube by painting or peeling off the stickers and then putting them back on again. And that lovely piece of plumbing I saw recently, which I took a photograph of, certainly there is a connection between the top pipe and the bottom one. But actually, it, it doesn't really matter um, why or how you've solved that problem in those cases, because people are clearly seeing in terms of their, um, their, their, the end result. And one of the big things, if you are going to assess the process, is to then reduce the value of the final deliverable. And it's very hard for students to be aware that quantity of time put into something. Oh, I spent 50 hours on this. Or look how big it is. It's this thick. It doesn't really make a difference in terms of their educational process. And in fact, sometimes making something shorter and smaller and more brief is actually better. We're not trying to buy cartons of milk here. Okay. Um, but the, you've got to bear in mind that also that 
that when somebody is engaged in the process, if they don't realize the significance of you assessing the process, that they, they might be a bit jobs worthy or they may not really care about that process because they're really focused on the, the final result over there or that, that deadline that they've got coming up. And so this, these slides really represent the idea that people, well, it's, it's, it's not my responsibility, I'm not supposed to do that, you know, someone else solved that problem. But the big thing here, of course, is that if we cut corners, students are going to be very aware of that and then they're going to, they're going to be tempted to cut corners themselves. Um, the other thing about this, and this is where we have to be aware of the, of the problem, is that if a job's worth doing, it's worth paying someone else to do it for you. And, of course, this is where things like SE banks can come in. Okay, so um, what, is the, what should education be, then? If, if, we're, if we're assessing the process in education, what should it be? And uh, some, a couple of lovely quotes here. Formal education will make you a living. Self-education will make you a fortune. So the process should be about this. It's about you know, what, what, to what extent have you changed your approach? Have you changed your attitude? Have you changed or learned from experience that will help to make you self-educating? And uh, Victor Hugo, a lovely quote here, he opens a school door, closes a prison. Um, the idea being that education is a liberator here. And I think this, this really kind of says it all for me. I like a visual representation. Okay, and um, one of my favorite quotes here. The best teachers are those who show you where to look but don't tell you what to see. So that's an important part of assessment design is the idea of using assessment as a way, way to, to give them an idea where to look but you're not giving them an assessment which is saying tick these boxes or provide me with five things that are red. You're giving them the chance to interpret that. Okay, so let's look back at the idea of assessment um, because assessment can, um, can be something, this is actually a sign near where I live and it says here danger, survivors will be prosecuted. And the important thing here to realize is that we have to be very pragmatic. We have to be very practical about the way in which we're approaching assessment. And given how heavy assessment is and how uh, students engage in the thing called assignmentitis, you know, where they focus very strongly on, is it assessed, is it assessed, is it on the exam? And they have that kind of tunnel vision. Is if they have to have that tunnel vision, then the process of assessment should be something where they're actually able to learn from doing that assignment and that's quite a tricky thing to, to, to do and, and in that respect if that process that they're going through is the thing that we're valuing because we know the effect it's going to have on them and their reflective ability then this is where the idea of plagiarism because we're not focusing on the end the, on the end result we're focusing on that process that we're going through um, the plagiarism then ceases to be so much of a threat and one of the, the redesigns that we come up with to reduce plagiarism is by saying, well, plagiarism ceases to be as important as it was. Again, the caveat being that it will mean more work for you as a lecturer. Everything I'm advocating or everything we're discussing ultimately means more time, more effort put in by you. And that's the, the, that's the sad side of it. But the process is then that you are much more reliable um, you, you have much more reliable information about their abilities as students. So, um, obviously, one of the big things about uh, re you know, redesigning assessment is to try and reduce plagiarism. And the, the big question we have to ask is, why are we trying to reduce plagiarism? Um, and obviously, the, you know, that would seem like a, an obvious thing. Well, because you know, we need to make sure students are worth the grade that they get and that they're cheating and that they're... Um, attacking the whole idea about what an education establishment is. Uh, so here's a couple of examples here. Um, look, one of my favorite uh, Marcus Aurelius quote quotes, to refrain from imitation is the best revenge. People will generally follow the herd. And the, I think that in the real world, um, for example, we've got a lovely Banksy quote here, copying is actually a success strategy and we need to be aware that copying is a, is a success strategy. And this is a, a lovely uh, example of the kind of 
twe nature with which uh, people look at plagiarism and how it's diminishing the value of education. But is it really? That's the question. Um, and so here's a couple of lovely videos I recommend that you go and have a look at later on. Um, these are intended to be quite funny. The first one is Spondex, is the idea of medicalizing. Um, the, uh, the idea of being happy as being a disease. And I think one of the things here is, is that people do talk about the idea of, um, of, of plagiarism as being a kind of a, an epidemic that's going to sweep and destroy the whole of, the whole of education. And un, uh, underneath here, this, um, this is a lovely video here, when you, if you get a chance to look at it. Um, this is the idea that uh, they're trying to sell as insurance. Now, one of the things I will say here, I am an expert panel member for the Turnitin and PlagiarismAdvice.org. But one of the things I do, I think that they, obviously they're trying to sell a product, which is the subscriptions to the Turnitin service. Uh, and there are alternatives available. Um, but the thing is that this idea of, um, of checking assessments for original material or unoriginal material is a real issue. And th that tool can be a very valuable way of, uh, of using it. However, we do have people trying to argue that um, that we're under threat, and uh, the, the idea of plagiarism being a threat is something that I would like to try and turn on it on its head if possible. And it's a, it's a lovely video whether we've got an insurance company trying to sell you insurance against robot attack. Now, obviously, I think anyone in their right mind will realise that robot attack is not something that's going to happen anytime soon, um, but people will try and play on your fears. And the important thing is to be confident. Okay, so what is the real threat? When well, we talked about plagiarism being a threat, well, one of the real threats here for me is the idea of the word cheat. And um, I think that, yeah, mm. um, I have an example here of a, of a, of a political statement I will you know, fess up, this is political. Um, you know, the, the use of the word scrounger in the UK's media uh, hit a bit of a high spot around about the time when the uh, Conservative uh, Liberal Democrat co coalition was elected. And all of a sudden, the use of the term scrounger has shot up. And uh, we've seen quite a lot of material in the press about benefit scroungers and cheats and so on and so on. And it's building this idea that everybody else in your street is taking your tax money and spending it on colour TVs and fags and so on. And obviously, that is ridiculous. Well, in the same way that when we use the, we hear the term cheat, student cheats, stealing words, stealing work, and so on, those are very emotive terms. And we have to be, I think that for me, that's the real threat here. We have to be realistic about that idea of, of what, what a problem plagiarism can be in the first place. Um, I've, we've got a couple of polls here. So one of the things I wanted to, to, to talk about, the idea of um, what kind of support do you provide with your students? So just before we go into the next section. Christine, if you can put up the next poll, thank you very much. So do you provide any or all of the following? Some things I don't provide. Um, I do provide access to draft commentaries. and I do clinics. I definitely involve students in my assessment design. But there are a few things that, that maybe I don't do so much. I personally don't do much um, explicit coverage of techniques used in assessment, and I suspect a lot of people don't. Um, maybe, maybe you can prove me wrong in that respect. But um, in fact, most people, a lot of people saying that they give comments on formative feedback on early drafts, which is brilliant to see. There's one example where if you do do that, you've then just increased your workload a lot. But it's actually a very valuable thing for the students, I think, before you have um, they've formally submitted the work. It's an interesting spread of different people. Mm. It's good. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Lovely. Um, now, the, the, there is another um, poll here on plagiarism. If we can pull it up, please. See what you think. It, am I wrong in assuming that plagiarism isn't as much of a problem as as it has been presented. So is it a huge plague? Is it merely a problem caused by outdated assessment? Oh, lots of people saying that. Oh, it's going up and down. It's exciting, it's like being an X factor. 
maybe. I'll sing later if you like. Okay. Plagiarism is cheating, there I've said it, and should be punished. Seems to have the edge. Okay. It's going it's going up and down between number two and number three. It's merely a problem caused by a data. Okay, well, I think we kind of settled that. It's very close, but we've just got a few more people saying it's a problem caused by assessment, and some people saying it's cheating. And the thing to remember, of course, is however outdated the assessment, if the rules say, don't do this, do that, and then you do the thing you're not meant to do, then you're right. I mean, when in Rome, be a Roman. And we have to accept that. There are rules there. We shouldn't just throw them all out. But we should also be aware that those rules may be addressing a topic that we do need to really, really debate and think about. Okay, so on to the next um, bit of the um, tip sheet, which is making it personal. Um, I think there's two sizes. I'd like to just expand that little idea about making it personal out a little bit. Because when we make it personal, it, that we are engaged in a, a, an activity with the students. It shouldn't just be making it personal from their point of view. Here's my assignment. You pick the essay topic or you pick the case study that's relevant to you. Um, making it personal actually also means that we should be engaging with students at, at their level. I mean, one of the big problems with assignments is that I write it, I hand it to you, you do it, you hand it back, I then do my academic consideration and give it a grade and give you some feedback ideally, and then that's it. I'm sorry, you have to accept what I've done, that's the academic statement. But one of the big things to bear in mind is that we should actually, we're not on high, you know, casting down our feedback for the students at this level. We actually need to ideally take ourselves down a few notches and work at that level. And that's where the idea of peer negotiated assignments or assessments comes in where we say to them, we have to do this assessment process. Now, we want you to be involved in that so you have an understanding of what we have to do in order to measure your performance. But then them being engaged in that level actually does this. It means that the students then are a bit more in control. And while that's scary, they have more of a buy-in to doing that then. Okay. And the big thing here uh, th these are all real photographs I've taken, by the way, is they need to know that they're going somewhere and that they can make their mark, that their opinions can be heard, that they can shape their own education. Otherwise, we're on a road to nowhere. And no one's going to get on... Well, I don't think many people are going to get onto that bus. Um, and that wasn't photoshopped, by the way. It's actually a real bus photograph I took the other day. Um, so the thing here is that students, if they're getting a choice as to where they're going, um, they're going to be more engaged in the process. That's the idea, anyway. Now, uh, I love this, this, this idea of feedback as well. Obviously, feedback is something that we have to do, we're expected to do. Um, thank you. Um, the... the um, Feedback is something I'm not particularly very good at. I will, you know, hand on hearts, uh, tell you I'm not a brilliant writer of feedback. I tend to have a bank of comments that I'll kind of use and cut and paste um, because I see a lot of the same problems over and over again. Um, I'm also very late with my feedback. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not holier than now. I'm a terrible academic in that respect. I'm always late with the marks. But it is important. I feel I'm exonerated a little bit because I have such a hands-on engagement with the students where I never want them to be in a position where they feel they have a, a, a loop that the hoop they've got to jump through. We have to have the idea of them knowing exactly what's expected of them, being able to give me copies and drafts and say, what do you think? What do you think? And also, I found that there's been times when actually having a discussion with the students has actually meant that I have changed my expectations for the final deliverable and that I've shifted myself and had to revise marking schemes. Obviously, you get them sent off to the external examiner to be, be assessed. Um, so I've got a little bit, a little questionnaire here, just, if, just another poll. Have you ever, if you can just pull that up for me, Christina, please. Thank you very much. 
Have you ever given cut and pasted feedback? I've definitely given that. Given audio and video feedback? Yes, I've done that. Provided feedback? Yes. <coughs> Being called out by students over the grade not coinciding with the, the comments. I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but I've definitely had that happen. Um, being asked what the feedback actually means. Yes, oh dear. Had graded assignments just sit there uncollected. Yes, that's me too. <laughs> Allowed peer review by the students to affect the final grade. I really like peer review, but it is something you have to be very careful with, and some people are very uncomfortable with it. And the final one is being overly positive or negative in the feedback. I think that's the only one I, I haven't done personally, but I, I have seen it when I've read, as an external examiner, I've read people's um, people's feedback and it's been, oh, this is absolutely fantastic, C. <laughs> this is the best thing ever, D+. Plus. Um, and obviously that, you know, or this is the worst thing I've ever read, A-. minus. Uh, and I think one of the big things is students often find that there's a dichotomy between the feedback that they're given and then the grade that they're given. And they often want to see there being a direct mapping between the two. And I think when there is a, that difference of opinion, uh, I've just today been dealing with students saying, but your feedback was quite positive. Why did I only get a low mark? I got a C. And I think that that is more than anything else reflects the fact that we as academics don't always understand when a student reads feedback that they that they don't have the faculty to see or the experience to see what that means in terms of a grade. But also, should they be connected, the feedback is quite an important thing for them to develop. But um, the grade is some kind of weird measure and they almost seem to be kind of orthogonal really where the grade goes one way and the feedback goes another way and obviously they are connected. But that's an important thing to to, to build trust in the students is the idea of the feedback you're giving, which is why it's important to give it early and often, um, that we have to be aware that that is going to potentially confuse the students. And they need to, to we all need to be educated and to, to learn how to do that more effectively. And here's an example. Um, this is actually a, uh, a, a piece of paper that appeared in, in the kitchen uh, over, over, over the side of me now. Um, and it was written by one of my colleagues, a lecturer whose name I have covered up. And, uh, and the, in traditional, wonderful, educational style, this piece of paper saying, please keep the kitchen clean, was then assessed by someone. And this is the problem where we have a very strong focus of what we think assessment should be, that we can't help but do it. Even on that little piece of paper saying, please, can you clear up the kitchen? Someone gave it a C10. If you look down here, I don't know if you can read that. Um, but the big problem is um, is this, um, and something that we may not always be aware of, but when we judge a person, it really is more defining who we are than anything else, and we can actually be very, just far too focused on the task, and not necessarily aware of the whole background of what's going on. So. Uh, and I, my apologies to my colleague who actually had to experience this uh, assessment of his plea. So the big thing, of course, is to realize that when we're assessing and how we're assessing isn't something that students are always going to be aware of. Um, so we can see some wonderful examples here of, uh, of people uh, not being aware of the significance of what, what, what they're doing. Um, so. It, uh, Rachel Ray, one's inspiration in cooking her family and her dog. Um, a literacy program. Another illiteracy program. And this is my advice to you. Never don't not assume nothing about what is easy for you to do. Um, the big thing here is for, for when you're a student, you, 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 what, what I as a lecturer take for granted, a student isn't necessarily going to be aware of. So we, this is what goes back to that previous poll where I said, do you give explicit support for the techniques used in the assessment you're using? And if you didn't answer that, and there are times when I don't do that, um, then this is the result. This here is the result where people are not aware that the process that they're going through is something that they need to be more, more aware of. So, ah, 
encouraging peer review. Uh, okay, um, this is a real photograph, and sadly not one I took. It's one I've stolen from the internet. Um, but it really says it all. Uh, one of the biggest challenges of peer review is um, is the oh he's already said it. I agree with him. Effect, and unfortunately, that's really really difficult to overcome. Uh, and one of the only things you can do is you can say no. It's important for you to, to value that what you're saying, uh, it, your opinion is valued, it is important that you get the chance to say that and that you don't just say, yeah, same as what, same as what she said. Um, that you, because it isn't, it's very rarely is exactly the same. And that's the biggest challenge I think in terms of encouraging peer review is the idea of saying, well, no, everyone does have to say something. And there are a number of ways in which we can do that. And uh, it's important that, that we uh, students are aware that um, that they, they have to be genuine. It can't be fake. It has to be a genuine smile. But I encourage group assignments. Yes, I do all the time. The big problem with group assignments is you have to have something in place to make sure that the group are aware of the group responsibilities. And that you have a way, you must be able to assess them individually in group assignments. And that's what I do all the time. I always have something in place to allow individuals to say what they've done as part of the group work. And that there's always, always an individual piece of work that's assessed at the same time as the group material. And, and the thing here to realise is that... Um, is that we can't treat students homogeneously. We have to make sure that we um, that we um, deal with different students at different levels. They'll start from different points and they're going to end at different points. And that's very, very important for us to remember. And we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to speed up a bit. Okay, so the final thing really here is the idea of getting students to think for themselves. Um, and this is really, really telling. The idea, the idea of study being the act of texting, eating, watching television with an open textbook nearby. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and say that a lot of the things I've already been discussing, so the idea of um, making it personal, having a more direct communication, um, the idea of students being involved in developing their own assessments, is all part of make, uh, encouraging them to think for themselves. You can't. You can lead them to water. You can't make them drink, but you can in the way in what you're asking for. So this is the big thing here. Don't ask for a deliverable and say the deliverable is the only thing I value. The process is not important. Just hand me in that thing at the end, and you're done. And I'll assess that because if you do that, then there's much less reflection, much less opportunity for them to think about the process that they're going through. And that's actually the big thing I would say in terms of redesigning assignments. So, how often have we been in, in what, we, what appears to be an impossible situation? Keyboard not found. Um, here's a lovely alternative way of looking at something, uh, which came from a real newspaper, uh, TV guy clipping. And we have to try and think of different ways of thinking about things. Um, because we can't solve them using the same way of thinking. And this is one of my favorite pictures here, the idea of don't just recycle, reuse. There's a wonderful boat there made out of Coke bottles. And I think we have to try and think of what have we got right now that we can reuse in a different way in order to solve the problem of getting students to think. And actually, they're a big resource. They probably can help us. I said to a student, how would you assess this? How would you try and avoid plagiarism in, in your coursework? They might come up with something that's absolutely really fantastic, and then I can steal that and become very famous. Okay, and um, I think the whole point here is that the someone asked earlier about allowing to fail, and I think we have to re be aware of the fact that we we also need to be able to fail. I've su successfully failed on many occasions to try new ideas, and uh, but. If we don't try different things, we're going to end up with the same problems we've already had. And we do have to try and come up with kind of 
less in less obvious ways of solving the problems that, that we can um, try and give people the chance to solve them for themselves. We've got one more poll coming up here, and then we get some. I'm going to just take that back a slide. Can we just have the last poll up, please? So, um, have you ever set what to do but not how? Definitely done that at times. Use problem-centered or inquiry-based learning. I love those. They're really good approaches. Ask the question that doesn't have a definitive answer, which is a really nice thing. And um, the last one, which I've certainly noticed, is that my students often are under a lot of stress because I'm asking them to do things that are not clearly defined. There is no tick box for them to tick. And I've noticed that the students when students support in that position they don't like it they do feel a lot of stress and what we have to do ideally is try and manage that stress and realize it's going to be there not be afraid of it because you will get students complaining you will get students being very vociferous and they're not very happy about the process they're going through they want to know exactly what to do and what what loop hoop to jump through and how to deliver the thing that's going to get them that grade that they want to get and that will cause them stress when you don't give them that crutch to sit on Thank you for that. It's lovely. Nice. Good, good to see people have asked questions that don't have definitive answers. That's brilliant. I think, I, su I su suspect that we're kind of preaching to the converted here a bit. Some really good, re really good responses from people. Just to finish off then, um, a couple of things. The, that level of stress is something that actually we will go through as well. Um, and it's important that we realize that, that obviously I would recommend you look at the, the slides for this talk afterwards and go through this in more detail. I'm not going to cover it too much now. Um, but it is important that we accept ourselves as imperfect, that we, um, that we develop our skills. But these are all, all these things down here are also things we need to try and encourage our students to do as well. Um, and the idea is that we can change the world. Okay, so we all of the people who've been listening to me today, all forty odd of you, thank you very much. And if we start trying new things and talking loudly about them, we're going to get to the situation as this cartoon represents, which is the idea that we're going to we're going to slowly win everybody over, and it's going to be great, and we're going to change the world through different assessment methods. And just to finish off before we have some questions, I'm sorry I've talked a lot. I hope we can get a chance to carry on and do some chat after the main session's finished. But the important thing is, take a chance. Try something new. Everything will be fine. And I'm finished now, so we've got time for just a few questions. Hi there, Mike. Thanks uh, very much for that. I'm sure everyone will agree that that was a, a really, really great session. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mike um, that haven't been answered? One of the questions um, that was asked, Mike, that you've already answered again was, should we encourage uh, group assignments? Um, so I'm not sure if anyone has any other questions that are going to be coming in. Yeah, a few. Oh, a few. No, just, uh, one of the questions um, Sarah Hamilton's asking, how do you convince traditional academics to try something new in a study? Okay. Um, right. Uh, yes, there's two approaches. One is to lead by example and be a kind of champion of that kind of change and try something out and don't tell anyone about it until you get told off. Uh, and the other is to, is to try and recognize that there's going to be people actually trying interesting and different things, but they're not aware that they're interesting and different already because they're not talking to everyone else. So the big thing is talk to people about what they're doing and don't talk to them about what you're, what you're doing until you can actually show something that works. And don't believe people when they tell you that something's not going to work. Don't bother. I've, tr I've done that. I've tried that. It doesn't work. Because that's their experience once, and they gave up. So try new things and realize that they're going to be train wrecks. They're going to be things that go horribly wrong. As long as you hand on heart, don't disadvantage the student. Does it matter? Great, thanks very, very much. I don't think, oh, there's just uh, one more question. I think we'll take the last question, which is, isn't there a research out there to back up the cause? That's from... Uh, yes, Wendell. some of the links which I put up at the start of the chat, or were at the start of the chat, are fairly recent um, discussions uh, that are talking about the idea of, does feedback work? 
do we need to try different approaches? There are certainly other bits of research out there that can support that. The difficulty is that research supporting an idea doesn't necessarily change people's perceptions. Um, just look at the way in which people are still convinced that global warming doesn't exist. <laughs> a lot of research out there that's showing that it does and that man has had an impact, and yet people are still not believing it. So you have to actually give people the buy-in, the thing that will personally benefit them from the process in order for them to sign up for this, I think. And that is, that's difficult. That's, that's more emotional and political. And we have to be very diplomatic rather than research-led, which is a real shame, unfortunately. Right, thanks very much for that, Mike. I think we've run out of time now for uh, any further questions. So, uh, again, a big thanks to Mike for sparing the time and obviously taking us through different ways of reducing pages and through assessment design. Um, just to go over what's coming up next, as I, I put a link earlier on in for the tip sheet, it is actually available on the plagiarismadvice.org website. And you can also see the URL in um, the tip sheet that's on your screen now. Um, I think Mike's also just put his information in the chat box. If anybody have any further questions, you can drop him an email and they'll be more than happy to get in touch with you. Um, just again, a, a continuation, basically, our next week webinar is going to be on a quick guide to referencing, and it's going to be taken by Radhika Ayer O'Sullivan from the British University in Dubai, and that'll be Wednesday at 12 o'clock British Standard Time. So um, anyone who wants to come along to that is more than welcome to, and there's a link there for the webinars, again, more information on, on how to sign up to that. Um, there will be a recording of this session, 